NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory presents the Von Karman Lecture, a series of talks by scientists and engineers who are exploring our planet, our solar system, and all that lies beyond. Brian White from the Office of Communications and Education, and welcome to this evening's Von Karman Lecture, Small Worlds, Big Science. James Bond, Tom Hanks, Psyche, Monty Python, and La Petite Prince. Some of you got it. These are all names of asteroids, small worlds in our solar system. Now, what can asteroids, planetesimals, or small worlds teach us about the origins and evolution of our solar system? These worlds be but little, they be fierce. Our speaker tonight a, is a principal scientist, joined JPL in 1990 after receiving a PhD in geophysics from Columbia University in 1989. She assumed the role of deputy principal investigator and project scientist of the Dawn Discovery mission to Vesta and Ceres in 2002 and became the mission's principal investigator in 2018. She currently serves as a co-investigator on the Europa Clipper and Psyche missions. In addition to her flight project work, she manages the Small Bodies Office uh, within the Solar System Exploration Directorate here at JPL. She has over 300 publications, has received two exceptional achievement medals from NASA, the Antarctic Service Medal, and is a fellow of the Geological Society of America. Now, this is my favorite part about her. In 2014, asteroid 10724 was named Carol Raymond to recognize her work on the Dawn mission. Please help me welcome Dr. Carol Raymond. Have fun. Thank you, Brian. Thank you all for coming. It's amazing how excited people get about the fact that I have an asteroid named after me. <laughs> it's like my greatest achievement. <laughs> um, and in fact, it's, um, it's one of the great honors of, of doing this kind of research, because there are a lot of asteroids out there, as, as you'll find out in my talk, and uh, they all need names. So, <laughs> so our esteemed colleagues um, from time to time contact the International Astronomical Union and, and nominate um, people to, for these bodies to be named after. So um, it's not a uh, distinctive honor. It's one that's shared by many, but it's, it's, it's a great honor um, nonetheless. So let's get started. Um, I have a lot of material to go over tonight, and I'm going to try to go through it rather quickly, both to keep you engaged and to make sure there's time for questions at the end. So um, what I'm going to try to do today, tonight, is, um, is give you a taste of what small bodies can tell us about our solar system. And in particular, what we've learned from the Dawn mission, which recently concluded its operations, and what we may learn from the Psyche mission, which is um, now in preparation for launch. Um, and then we'll, we'll take a little bit of a look at what's next. So starting at the beginning, um, our star began um, as a cloud of gas and dust. Um, it was likely formed by a shock wave from a nearby supernova explosion, compressing the interplanetary uh, medium into a dense nebula. And that nebula started to, um, to condense into grains and then the grains were accreting together, sticking together, and then becoming planetesimals. And then from these um, planetesimals, these, these small pieces, came eventually the planets. And an important thing about the fact that our star, our solar nebula was born out of a, uh, a nearby supernova explosion is that that supernovae uh, seeded the nebula with radioactive material, short-lived radioactive material. And as that material decayed, it gave off heat. And heat is one of the uh, primary ingredients to begin um, processes, as anybody who cooks knows. <laughs> you put your ingredients together, you turn on the heat, and things happen. 
So this is an artist rendition of that um, swirling uh, disk uh, nebula of, of gas and dust and um, the gaps forming where material has been clumping together into planetesimals. And what, we're, what we are trying to um, understand about this process is whether the outcome in terms of our planets and the other bodies in our solar system were largely affected by chemical variations within that disk. Did it start with um, a lot of you know, variations of material? Um, how did the time at which these things came clumping together and, and forming affect the outcome of what they ended up being? And then what processes post-formation mixed all that material together within our solar system? So we're sort of looking at nature versus nurture versus where you live or something like that. You know, people, people moving around changes the character of the neighborhood. So here's a, a, a nice, simple diagram. And our solar nebula was certainly not this simple to start out with. But it reinforces a few concepts that you'll need to understand. Um, and that's that the solar nebula was not, just a, was not just a flat plane of gas and dust. If I could control this thing, I could show. <laughs> um, so it wasn't just a disk, but it was more of a torus. So as you get further away from the proto-sun in the center, um, the, the disk expands. It's also cooler the farther away you get from the proto-sun. And um, the chemistry the, therefore changes. And the chemistry changes for two reasons. One is the temperature. And the second is that um, you may have sources uh, uh, bringing material in to the outer edges of the disks and, and also falling in from the top. That, that may be changing the chemistry um, with, with distance um, from the center. So the chemistry is recorded in these bodies that are forming within um, the nebula. And so this is, uh, these are little icons to show you that um, the, each body carries a chemical fingerprint of the material it formed from um, at its, at its uh, particular place in the disk. And then um, post-formation, there, um, we know that things moved around, and um, we'll, we'll talk about that later. And so the, the motion of, of the objects also um, played a big role in how we, um, uh, what we ended up with today. So let's take a look at um, what we know of the main asteroid belt, and eventually you'll see in this graphic also, all of the, as the objects near the Earth, the so-called uh, near-Earth object belt. Um, and we're going to see what we knew starting from 1970. There's a, a, chrono a, a, a clock running in the corner here. That it's also over here, and I apologize. It's really hard to see. But I'm going to be um, narrating for you as we go through time and, and tell you some of the events that you'll see occurring. So let's get started here. So 1970, um, this is what we knew of, of the, um, the distribution of asteroids in the main belt. And let me try this way. There we go. I'm pointing in the wrong direction. Um, and as you'll see, all these blue dots are individual asteroids. And then every once in a while, you'll see a little burst. There's one. Now, that is likely um, that the Palomar telescope was looking for um, asteroids following Jupiter or leading Jupiter, the so-called Trojans. And if a telescope is, is trained in a certain part of the sky at a certain time, it's going to see everything in that direction. And that's why these little bursts of, of detections show up in this, um, in this animation. So we're going along. Now it's 1982. More telescopes are coming online, and you'll start to see a very rapid increase in the number of, of known objects. And in particular, um, there's, there's going to be a, a lot of uh, bursty activity going on. So again, each of these is uh, a, a specific survey that was looking for something probably out in the outer planet regions. 
And, and now you're starting to see that they're going off much more regularly. And so that's when these um, tracking teles telescopes started to track the objects near the Earth, from the um, near-Earth objects through to the main belt. And all of a sudden, um, th this torus this starts to really fill in. And then you're starting to see that the, the area around the Earth is also becoming much more populated. So now we're at year 2000. And as you can see, things are really starting to take off. Um, we, have, we have dedicated survey telescopes in Arizona, in Hawaii. Um, they're, they're operating um, all the time, um, focused on trying to find these objects. And you may have heard about a congressional mandate to find all of the objects greater than one kilometer in diameter with, um, with in the near-Earth object population. And so that is uh, also one of the motivations for um, some of these surveys that are looking out um, at all of these objects that are in our midst. So if, you, if, you, if these objects were large enough and, um, and shiny enough, uh, the, the, the night sky would just be you know, uh, com completely bright with um, all of these dots, but um, just one thing to take away from this, we're, and we're almost at the end, um, when you go home, don't worry about these things hitting us. <laughs> <laughs> because the fact that we know where they are, and we track them, and we actually do that from JPL. Uh, JPL tracks every known um, object that's, uh, that's in, the main, uh, in the near Earth asteroid belt, and, um, and we'll be um, you know, alerting to the hazard when, when anything looks out of sorts. So, um, so, so this is just an amazing population, though, of, of objects. And each of them um, is, is a fragment of that original process of uh, material coalescing that eventually ended up um, building the planets of our solar system, the planets, the moons, um, et cetera. And, some of it is original material, like the, the pieces that came together and were their own things, which we call planetesimals. And then others are just shattered remnants of those original objects, and we call that collisional debris. So we have still the, some of the original uh, accretionary you know, objects, and, and a lot of the material is small collisional debris or things that have kind of come back together after being blown apart. Now, uh, one other thing that, uh, uh, another new model or theory that has been around uh, for about a decade now um, is, is called, is about um, giant planets scattering material um, from uh, in the inner solar system and outer solar system, basically uh, moving material in and out um, in a very catastrophic way. So um, I'm going to show you a little animation here. Um, these four circles are the original orbits of the giant planets, so Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune. And um, in the middle is the uh, you know, still accreting material of the inner solar system. And as these planets grow, their uh, gravitational perturbations so they're, they're becoming more massive, and therefore their, their gravity is becoming more massive. And they can interact with each other in resonances. And a resonance is simply when, you know, if, if you are um, whipping something up, you know that if you keep um, pushing in the same direction, that it's, something's going to go faster and faster, right? And the same thing for a planet. If, a pl if two planets interact in the same manner over and over again, then all of that energy mo momentum transfer just c keeps accruing um, to have a much bigger effect. So that's what happens with, as these planets are growing. They start to, to move a little bit in their orbits, and then they hit these resonances, and all of a sudden, you know, everything scatters. So that's what you'll see in this um, little animation. And in the, now we're seeing, the, we're seeing Jupiter and Saturn come in in the solar system, and then move back out. And that's what's called the Grand Tack model. And if you're a sailor, you'll know why it's called the Grand Tack, because Jupiter and Saturn go one way, they go in, 
They turn around because the gas is dissipated. They've basically um, all already accreted all of the material, and now they're, they're being driven back out. And I want to make a, a point here. So I've just explained to you the, um, this theory of, of, of scattering by giant planet growth and migration. But I also want to make the point that look at the, just how much material is left after this process takes place. And I just showed you how much material um, we know about. It's, it looks like a lot, and it is a lot. But it's about a tenth or less, of, you know, less than 10% of what we think was in the inner solar system to begin with. So a lot of that material was ejected um, in populating um, areas outside of the giant planet region. OK, so that's kind of the end of, of the big picture of, of why uh, study of these objects is important. But then I always like to bring it back to why should any of you care? <laughs> um, what it, why is this important? Um, and it really does pertain to some big questions, like how unique is our water-rich water planet, which unfortunately is getting less water-rich <laughs> um, every year. But we have, um, you know, Earth is in a, a very odd position, being um, an ocean planet in the inner solar system. Um, Mars is dry, Venus is hot and dry, um, and Earth is in the Goldilocks zone. Now, Earth formed um, from the same feedstock or the same materials as these other planets. It went through um, a process of melting forming its iron core and, and basaltic crust. And so we know it was hot enough to boil off uh, most of its internal water. So the fact that it's an ocean today is a little bit perplexing. Um, there's, there's two main reasons for it, we think. One is that um, water was delivered to the Earth after it formed. And that water was likely coming from objects that that were water rich, impacting the Earth and leaving the water behind. Um, the Earth's gravity is high enough that it can retain those um, volatiles that were delivered. And then the other important aspect of um, the Earth is that it has a protective magnetic field, which keeps the solar wind, which is very corrosive, to, um, to light elements like water. It keeps the solar wind from stripping all of that atmosphere away um, and ocean away. And that's what happened to Mars when it lost its magnetic field. Then the surface water it had and the atmosphere it had were highly um, degraded. So I kind of got ahead of myself. Um, but you know, we're, we're really after these questions of where, where exactly did the Earth get its water? What objects brought the water? And then when and where were conditions for life met during old, early solar system history? because you've put two and two together, and I just said there's other objects that have water that were bringing it to the Earth. And so if they had water and they had energy sources, then they could potentially have been little habitats for life themselves. So this is, this is all part and parcel of the big questions in planetary science. OK, so one more piece of um, sort of the recent um, modeling and uh, and understanding of the materials that we have in hand, which are meteorites, um, there's a, a recent recognition that our, um, our solar system formed our, the, the main defining event of our solar system's formation was likely uh, the formation of Jupiter um, at a very early time in history. So here, uh, the, the axis on this plot, I'm going to get to this in a sec. The axis on this plot is in time after CIA formation. And C CAI formation is calcium aluminum inclusions, which you find in chondrules, which are the very first solar system solids. So let, let's just take that as time zero. Um, you don't have to understand what they are and how they form, just that. Um, when you find these in a rock and you date them, they have a specific age. That's the age of the beginning of formation of bodies in the solar system. And what we find is that um, 
the, the very first objects, because they had the most aluminum 26, which was generating a lot of heat, um, those early forming planetesimals all melted and formed iron cores. So um, that led to the, um, when, they, when, these, when these objects were disrupted, they were smashed up, then the iron became chunks, and eventually some of those chunks fell to Earth as meteorites. And so we have all of these different classes of meteorites that have very um, non-original names of, you know, one, two, three, A, B, C, D, you know, things like that. Um, but it's recognized now that these form two distinct groups. And one are associated with um, non-carbonaceous bodies. So uh, carbonaceous, another word that, me that you'll need to understand means um, it, it stands in for light elements like carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, all of these so-called volatile elements, the things that are easily lost um, because they're light and they're, um, they're volatile. And so we find uh, there's a group that um, is associated with non-carbonaceous meteorites and a group that's associated with carbonaceous iron meteorites. And they're very different in their um, isotopic ratios of certain elements. This is tungsten. And you don't need to know um, the, the, the details of that, just that there are these two separate groups. So we know that early on in solar system history, the really, really uh, first steps, we had some sort of a boundary, some sort of a separation of reservoirs. So we call these these area, you know, these um, regions where material is coalescing to form uh, individual bodies a reservoir. And um, so we have these carbonaceous and non-carbonaceous iron meteorite reservoirs. So at time zero, um, we can see that we had mainly these non-carbonaceous iron meteorites. And that means um, formation in a hotter environment. So formation closer to the protostar, the protosun. And as time went on, you can see this is time on the axis here, um, the carbonaceous iron meteorites uh, formed a little bit later. And um, the explanation for this, and then go going farther up, there's also then the, the follow-on bodies, the chondrites um, that, that are the, not the iron meteorites, but the actual uh, stony parts of these bodies. And you see that, um, that by, by the time of three to four million years after CAIs, um, there were these two distinct populations of, of bodies forming. So what we um, now understand, or the leading hypothesis, is that Jupiter formed up to about 20 ma Earth masses. The core of Jupiter formed at about one million year past CAIs. And then it kept growing its gaseous envelope until about um, four million years and separating these two reservoirs. So you might ask, okay, why is that important? Well, the water is out here and the terrestrial planets are forming in here. So it's already telling you that um, we've lost, you know, we've lost communication between the, the um, very volatile rich material and, and where our, our planet, our terrestrial planets are forming. So we're gonna take a look at the mission results from Dawn and, and find out what we learned more specifically about some of these processes um, that were occurring. So uh, Dawn was a fantastic mission um, propelled by an ion engine that went out um, into the main belt and visited two asteroids, or two bodies. Um, one is the giant asteroid Vesta and the other is the dwarf planet Ceres. Um, and it, it did this over the course of um, an 11 year mission and um, what broke many records for uh, longest powered flight and, um, and certainly first to, um, to any objects in the main belt, much less going into orbit around two. Um, Dawn's targets then were Vesta and Ceres, and these are the two most massive objects in the main asteroid belt. And so I will get right into telling you about them. So this, is, this should just be review for you by now because I've um, gone through this uh, ad nauseum, um, but these two bodies are survivors from the earliest epoch of solar system history. And we were aiming to investigate the role of size 
and accretion time in their differentiation and interior evolution history. Now, the word differentiation means there are different layers. So you've got an iron core, a, a body that's homogeneous. Will, and when it melts, the iron will go to the center. It's heavy, it sinks. Um, then you'll get a, a more dense um, mantle made of things like olivine. And uh, finally, the lighter basaltic crust. And that's kind of a layer cake classic differentiation series. Uh, differentiation also just means any separation of materials um, that were initially you know, intimately mixed. Um, and so we'll see in the case of series, differentiation means something different. But we're going to look at uh, then why um, two bodies that uh, appear to be close together or, or are close together now um, and appear to maybe have formed closely in time uh, turned out so differently. And then um, also we want to see the effects of impact processes because as you recall, if stuff is um, really flying all around um, crazily during these dynamic scattering events, um, that has some implications for the bodies that get hit. So um, <clears throat> where are Ceres and Vesta located? They are in the main asteroid belt. And Vesta is, uh, if, so here we are looking plan view you know, down on the, the plane of the solar system. And here we're looking across. So um, 1.5 AU is, is the orbit of Mars, and then uh, 5 AU is the orbit of Jupiter. So um, in the, the main belt, there are clumps, and each of these like notches is a resonance of Jupiter's gravity field. So again, that, that's a place where nothing can live because it's being moved um, out of the way by Jupiter. And what happened um, with Vesta, which is roughly in this um, area, is it is so close to, um, to a major resonance that ma material, small, ma small pieces of Vesta that were excavated from the surface during impacts um, would move into these resonances because of, they were light enough and then that would send the material on an Earth-crossing orbit. So there's like a super highway to send pieces of Vesta to the Earth. And as a consequence, we have a lot of pieces of Vesta meteorites, and I brought one of them with me today. So this is a eucrite, um, and it's a piece of the crust of Vesta. A eucrite is like a basalt on the Earth. This is a little bit lighter than you would think about with basalt, but on Vesta, that's what it looks like. So uh, that'll play into um, the story a little bit later. Um, so let's just look at these two objects in size context, because we hear a lot about missions going to asteroids. We know that a lot of spacecraft have visited asteroids. And these are the asteroids that have been visited by spacecraft. And some of them are so small that you can't see them on this, um, on this slide. Um, and this doesn't have the most recent two, which are Bennu and Ryugu, um, but they would, be, they would be in this size fraction as well. So you know, the difference is that Vesta is a planetesimal, a protoplanet, a small world, as we call it. Um, and it's undergone planetary processes, and it appears to be intact from the time it formed at that various early epoch of, of the solar system. And as such, it, it literally is a little time capsule or fossil. And so, you know, we can interrogate it and find out what it has to tell us. And then Ceres, on the other hand, is, is a full-blown dwarf planet. It's a, a thousand kilometers in diameter. Um, it, it, you know, it's, it has a gravitationally relaxed shape, meaning its, its own rotation kind of uh, smooths its shape into a, um, a nice uh, spheroid. So these two guys are, um, are very special, and that's why they were the targets of our mission. And um, then if we look at them compared to the moon, you can see that um, they aren't they really aren't small objects. These are like really um, planetary scale bodies. And an important um, factoid is that together they make up 45% of the, 
of the mass of the entire main asteroid belt. So uh, I'll just keep going back to remember that mass, a donut of stuff that you saw. These two are the big swingers. They're the, they're the, the king and the queen. OK. So meteorites from Vesta. I already told you that we have a lot of them. And as it turns out, Vesta has an extremely um, specific reflectance spectrum in um, visible and IR light. So when um, the sun hits Vesta and you look at it uh, through a telescope, then you see specific absorptions of that solar spectrum, uh, which are related to the minerals on the surface. And there are these two here at, at um, what we call the one micron band and the two micron band. And all you need to know is that these two are very diagnostic of Vesta. And if you look at spectra of lots and lots of other bodies, you don't find that kind of a fingerprint on others. Now, there, there are a couple way out in um, the outer belt that have some similarities to the Vestan spectrum, but they're not as, um, as great a match as this. And here, um, what happened was we had all these HED meteorites, which are the Howardite, Eucrite, Diogenite series. They'd been studied in the lab. They'd been recognized that they belonged together. They were a sequence of, core, you know, kind of the, the mantle, which is the, um, the, the diagenite, the slower cooled, um, more crystalline materials that cooled interior to the small planet. Then you had the eucrite, much faster quenched, so like a, an extrusive lava. Um, and then you had howardite, which is just the broken up fragments, the breccia of impact processes on the surface. So this thing's been battered over 4.5 billion years, and so it's, you know, things have ground up into um, this melange, and that's what a howardite is. So they were called the HED series. They were studied in the lab. Um, here you see a eucrite spectrum, a diagenite spectrum. And in um, the late 60s, spurred by the Apollo, missions, um, some of my colleagues, Tom McCord, in particular the first planetary science graduate um, from the Caltech department, um, decided to look at, or to train telescopes on, on different objects and try to make matches to spectra in, of laboratory meteorite spe specimens. And it didn't take them long to make this match to Vesta, and it was a it was a confident match. There was no question that Vesta was the parent body of um, the HEDs. And they had a big project set up to keep doing this, and they didn't have any more success. <laughs> and, and that goes to, to prove the point that Vesta is a unique object, and that many of the objects in the main belt um, are, are more generically, um, you know, more generic and, and don't have these uh, very specific characteristics which tell us um, which rocks come from them. So that made Vesta an extra special object. Okay, so I need to move along here. Um, this is just a, to give you a, a comparison of Vesta in series. Um, Vesta is quite dense. It's more like the density of basalt, as I've been telling you. It's also, um, this is 530 kilometers in diameter, and it's got 40 kilometer topography. 40 kilometers. So just this, this um, bump at the bottom here, um, which is inside of a crater, that's bigger than Mount Everest in terms of you know, going from the bottom of the ocean to, to the top. Uh, so this is a very rugged planet. Ceres, on the other hand, bigger, um, 940 kilometers in diameter. Um, you see the density is much less because it's retained a lot of its water. Um, and, and that's a key to understanding um, the different evolution of these two bodies. Um, and it has less relief, but it's still, you can still see craters, and you can see it has highlands and lowlands. And, and that was somewhat of a surprise to us because we did know it had a lot of water um, from telescope uh, shape measurements. Um, showing that it had this kind of relaxed shape. But we didn't expect that the surface was strong enough to maintain topography. We thought it was much more like ice 
that would flow easily, and it might look like a bowling ball. That was my, my worst nightmare, is that we were gonna get there and the body was going to look kind of like a bowling ball. And then we're just trying to like figure out from these little like clues on the surface what was going on. That was not the case. <laughs> okay, so what did we learn? First, we, we knew that VESTA from the um, meteorites, we knew it was the HD parent body, we knew it was fully differentiated into an iron core, and we knew it was volatile pore. It, it had boiled off a lot of its water and other volatiles. And when, what we learned um, from looking at the elemental abundances, from looking at the, um, the detailed mineralogy and, and using gravity and topography to understand what was going on in the center, in the interior, we understand that it formed from already volatile depleted material. So that in the nebula, at the time this was forming, which was very, very early in the, in the like million year range, uh, already the nebula had lost a lot of its volatiles. And that's a key um, observation. Um, and it also accreted impact delivered volatile rich material. And you're gonna see some evidence of that. Um, at Ceres, we confirmed that it is volatile rich. It is partially differentiated. It did not form an iron core um, and experienced global aqueous alteration. So what that means is you've heard of hydrothermal vents on the ocean floor. And um, I think everybody's familiar with uh, the fact that the hot water will circulate through cracks in the, um, the seafloor or cracks in, in any kind of rock that, um, that has hot water going through it. And that hot water reacts with the rocks and it alters the minerals. And that alteration um, creates hydrated silicates, which are like clays. <laughs> um, and it also changes the chemistry. And, um, and we found abundant evidence for this process having occurred globally over series. We'll talk about that. Oops, sorry. So what we, we thought, this was our going in on series. We thought these things would be true, but what we learned was really so much more interesting than that. That the series is nitrogen rich, and nitrogen is one of those super volatiles. It it goes away um, when things heat up very quickly. So it's really stable only in the outer reaches of the solar system, not where Ceres is now. So that is a clue that Ceres did not form in situ, and we'll talk about that. Um, it's similar, but not a match to an altered um, carbonaceous chondrite, and um, really surprisingly has ongoing brine-driven geologic activity. Okay. Sometimes this gets a little bit flaky. Um, okay, it woke up, yeah. Okay, so uh, quickly go through a few of the results um, and, and why they were important to the overall story. So when, as I said, we, we confirmed that Vesta was the parent body of the HEDs, that was both satisfying that a, an hypothesis had been advanced based on ground-based data from telescopes, based on study of these rocks. We went there and we checked the box and said it was correct. Also, the, the, from the meteorites, geochemists had done models that looked at how much metal was missing from the, the basalts, um, which meant that from <coughs> from the stuff that Vesta accreted from, the metal had gone somewhere. And from that, they could judge that it had an iron core. So they, we didn't have the iron meteorites from Vesta. We had the, you know, the crust and we had part of the mantle, but we didn't have the core. But you could imply, you can infer that there was a core of a certain size based on the, what was left in the rocks. And what we found from our gravity measurements is a core of almost exactly the size inferred from those models. So again, that was a, another uh, very satisfying result. Um, and uh, I'll just point out that the, the, the radius of that core. So the radius of Vesta, remember I told you it's 530 kilometers in diameter, it's about 330 miles, um, but <clears throat> that's 265 kilometers radius 
this core is about 110 kilometers in radius. So it's a very substantial fraction of um, Vesta. It's a, a large core. Now, what we didn't expect and really had a hard time, um, not, not a hard time explaining, but had a lot of fun uh, trying to figure out um, what was going on, was that there's a big splotch of hydrated material on Vesta. So remember, I told you it melted. It formed a core. It boiled off its volatiles. Um, in fact, we expected that it was drier than the moon, because at least the moon has the solar wind bringing protons uh, you know, and, and implanting some material on its surface, kind of a steady stream of, of a low-level <clears throat> hydration. But Vesta is too far out for that. So when we found this spot of um, hydrogen from our gamma ray neutron detector, that, that orange, orangey spot there, and we found a, uh, a band depth indicative of hydrated minerals from the IR spectrometer, and they, they coincide, um, there was no question that we had hydrated material on the surface of Vesta. And it's at the equator where um, you would least expect it, because sometimes you can get hydrated, you can get water in cold traps at poles that don't see sunlight, but that's not the case here. So um, the conclusion uh, was that this material is accreted to Vesta, the stuff that got stuck onto Vesta by impacts bringing it in from elsewhere. And we can go back to the meteorites and ask, did, do we see any evidence of that? And sure enough, there it is. So these dark spots in this Howardite, remember again, that's that broken up melange of all the junk. It's the end product of the impact gardening process. Shows you little class of, of you know, probably eucrite and, um, and a bunch of other matrix materials. And then these dark things are class of carbonaceous chondrite. And people saw those in the Howardites, but they're like, yeah, there's some class of carbonaceous chondrite. Um, not unexpected. But what we didn't understand until we saw that map was it's a big percentage. It's a lot of material. And if you look at the, the concentration in this rock and you kind of um, add it up, it makes sense. So it, it was our first sort of smoking gun that um, there's a significant delivery of hydrous material to the inner solar system via the impact process. And that um, dark material shows up all across the surface of Vesta. So not just, um, we, we made the correspondence between that hydrated patch and a darker appearance of the surface. But if you look um, everywhere on Vesta, you see a lot of these um, dark and bright uh, very, you know, dark and bright contrasts. And, and this was, is just a beautiful example of how there's some stratigraphy in the surface. There's some layering of this bright and dark material. It's being excavated by a small crater. And, and this color map, which is giving you an idea of mineral variations, is also showing you that there's some, some different um, minerals involved in this. So Vesta turned out to be... Um, it was super interesting and, and, and quite um, intriguing in its geology. And, um, and that big surprise of, of the hydrated material led us to, um, to look more carefully at some other features. So here in uh, a recent Marcha crater, you can see uh, the, the layer of dark material cropping out here along the crater wall. I think I have a close up here. And this native bright Vesta material um, sitting on top, you can see it kind of falling down and covering that up. So, um, so you know that dark material got laid down before that other material got laid on top. Um, and you can, you can look at these so-called superposition relationships. What, you know, what came first, what went on top, et cetera, and, and work out a history. And we'll take a little tour of this crater. And as we go around, I want to point out a couple of other features that um, gave us a clue about what might be going on uh, overall. And that's that there are, uh, there's some very smooth material that you can see right here, um, sitting up on a, like a bench on the side of the crater. And then deep within the crater here, we're gonna get a close up in the next slide, are um, so-called pits. So they're, they're like little um, 
indentations, but they're not due to small impact craters because they don't have rims. So they're just, uh, they're just like a hole. Um, and then you saw the, the bright and dark layers that I showed you previously cropping along here. Um, and you can also see just a, a lot of different textures to this crater, and it's, and it's not a, a, a very circular one. So these volatile release pits, uh, well, we, we figured out these are volatile release pits, um, and they're very analogous to pitted terrains on Mars. So what we think is happening here, um, and, it's, and we, we found them in another uh, small crater where you can see this kind of um, bumpy texture in the bottom of this crater. We also found that um, associated with those pits, the bumpy texture, were these, um, <clears throat> these sinuous gullies. So um, some of the gullies on, on Vesta have straight, um, a, a, a straight geometry, and that is associated with dry material flowing down slope. But we all know that when water flows down slope, it tends to meander and, and things you know, merge together as they go down. Um, so-called sinuosity. And we find these sinuous gullies uh, in association with the pits. And um, even though it's a preposterous conclusion, the best explanation for these gullies is that the water was flowing for a short period of time um, in these craters. So yeah, that was like, uh, we had to have a lot of discussions about, you know, could, could that even be happening? So, so here's um, just a cartoon that um, I'll end with for Vesta that kind of summarizes the importance of you know, going to this body and, and investigating it in, um, in some depth and, and really bringing it all home to how, did, how, were, how was, what processes in this, were operating in the solar system during its formation and evolution. So we think what happened is that you know, Vesta formed and had this pre-existing uh, surface, and ice-rich bodies pelted it. Um, that ice was buried in the subsurface. It may have been liquid, and then it froze. <clears throat> and as soon as you put just the slightest cover of dust on ice, it can be stable over um, eons. So we think that um, in this case, the, the um, the, the ice was buried, and then a, a crater occurred later on. Another impact occurred. It excavated um, that ice. It melted it. It then flowed down the walls of the crater um, and melted the transient reservoir beneath, and then that material ex uh, exhaled its volatiles, and they, it was released through these little pits. So we now, um, again, have that evidence that not only did the, this volatile rich material get delivered to Vesta, this dry, differentiated body, but it also seems to have been able to sequester it and reactivate it through the impact process to form these little reservoirs. And that was just a, a hugely um, interesting and unexpected result. So um, we're, we'll leave Vesta with this question, did C-type bodies deliver water to Earth like they possibly did to Vesta? Okay, well, uh, Ceres is like a C-type body. I told you it's similar to a C-I chondrite. Um, it formed from abundant volatile material. Um, and the presence of ammoniated material, I told you it was nitrogen rich. The nitrogen is in the form of ammonia, which has reacted with the rocks and formed um, clays, which contain ammonia. And we find those pervasively all over the surface. So whatever process cooked the rock with the ammonia to make these clays happened everywhere, pretty much the same. And we, we infer from that um, that it was a global subsurface ocean environment. Um, so this global alteration also, um, the, the presence of the water and the circulation of the water moderated the internal temperature. So the fact that the water was there and it was, um, the ice melted, the water was circulating, and it was carrying the heat out of the core. So Ceres did not heat up internally high enough to melt the silicates into, you know, separate the metal from the other um, phases. 
So Ceres never got to the same point of its evolution that Vesta did, forming the iron core. And it was able to retain then its water fraction because it didn't heat up that high. Um, so that was, that's probably the biggest difference between Vesta and Ceres. And um, I'll, I'll fill in a few details of, of, of why that's important. But another major finding that was uh, very important was that organics were detected. Um, this is uh, inorganic, insoluble organic matter, not associated with biologic activity, but organic matter all the same. It could have been inherited from uh, the protosolo and nebula. Um, it could have been produced within series from, um, from the native uh, materials. But all we know is it's only in one location. And uh, in general, Ceres is representative of a class of large, volatile, rich bodies that are much more similar to the moons of Europa and Enceladus, the moon of, of um, Saturn, than, um, than it is to other uh, asteroids in the main belt. So it really stands out as its own, um, its own thing. It's a, the only dwarf planet in the inner solar system. It's the only body that looks like itself. Um, so it's, it's a rock star. It, it's just, it was just, just a, a, a treasure trove, the most amazing target to go investigate. Um, OK, so this is, uh, in, this is kind of the, uh, the movie version of series evolution. So we started out with water, CO2, silicates, and ammonia hydrates. So those are um, all your volatiles and, um, and your rocks. And then you begin to cook it. And now we know because of the amount of melting implied by all that alteration that Ceres had to have had um, a, a significant enough amount of aluminum 26 to, to perform that melting or to, to achieve that much melting. So that places it only uh, maybe a, a million or two years separated from Vesta in its accretion. And again, when I showed you that um, initial plot of the isotopes um, on, and the non-carbonaceous and the carbonaceous um, iron meteorites, you, you saw that there was those two groups and they were separated by about that same um, amount of time. So it seems like series of Vesta are kind of straddling that divide created by Jupiter um, that's implied by that, that model based on the iron meteorites. OK, so back to Ceres. So it, it, it heats up, the ice melts, the mud is kind of like a muddy slurry, starts to convect, and then eventually um, the water makes its way um, through the matrix and to form this, this nice brine-rich layer. Um, our, our, we call it a subsurface ocean, could have been a, a fairly muddy ocean but it had to have been a global, a global layer. And then we would have had a nice ice shell covering that. And in the center, these hydrated clay type um, minerals. So that's, um, that was the early evolution. And then what happened is over time, the impacts will erode this icy shell. Anytime you smash something into ice, the ice is, at series it's rather warm compared to say, Europa or Enceladus because um, we're in the inner solar system. It's about uh, 240K the surface, 155 below the surface, whereas the surface of Europa is about 70K. So impacts coming in will sublimate the ice, um, excavate the ice, and um, you're left with a, a gardened mixed uh, crust that has ice but is not pure. And then um, where our ocean has frozen out to, for the most part, but we're seeing um, evidence for um, at least pockets of brine driving geologic activity over time. And this was the huge surprise at Ceres um, because we really did not expect that it had any ongoing geology. And that's, of course, the same case as we found with Pluto, um, the New Horizons mission thought that you know, we were going to see Pluto as just this frozen world. And it is very cold, but there is active geology. So um, there is ample, OK, so 
Um, the resume brine separate surface and bulk elements of composition differ. Those are mainly of interest to scientists, but <laughs> um, <laughs> but they're important. Um, so you know the, the the real message here though is that these are these are all super interesting worlds, and they're you know we could we could do a drive by and just you know take a few pictures, but going and looking at them up close and and really understanding them um, brings a an amazing amount of information to bear on testing a lot of the existing models and driving um, other models forward. So uh, here's just a picture to show you then what we figured out the interior of series looks like. It's actually not green. That's just <laughs> artistic. Um, but we have a crust that's, that's mostly, um, it's only about 30% ice. It's about maybe 30% rock. And then it's got a lot of salt and, um, and clathrates. Clathrates are um, gas hydrates. So it's, it's, a water, it's a cage of water molecules with a gas molecule in the middle. It's what causes um, drilling rigs to blow out in the Gulf of Mexico when they hit it and they destabilize and the gas decides to um, come to the surface really quickly. So um, we found that, a lot, that there's a lot of that at Ceres. It also makes the crust really strong, which is why we see all those craters that we weren't expecting. So um, we, we now know a tremendous amount about how the, um, all of the material inside of Ceres um, was interacting, the, all of the, um, the individual elements, the, the minerals that were being formed uh, at what time, and what we could expect in terms of the length of time the sur subsurface ocean was operating. And that indicates to us that um, there was a, a, a good a portion of hundreds of millions to maybe a billion years when there was a substantial amount of fluid um, in the center of Ceres or in the, under the surface of Ceres. And that um, coupled with its, uh, the energy from the, uh, the chemical disequilibria could have provided the ingredients for life. So Ceres is um, considered you know, one of those objects that has had a, has a potential to have been a habitable environment in the past by virtue of it being a uh, frozen ocean world. And it's certainly one that we'll go back to at some point in the future and try to understand better um, what that potential is. Um, OK, and that we also know from the shape, the overall uh, round shape, that um, there is this weak layer within um, b beneath the crust. And we think it's where, you know, it's where this, like, line is drawn in this cross section, it's likely there's a, a, a thin layer of fluid, of briny fluid, salty fluid, um, that's residual from that global ocean. And it's just, it's not allowing the, the body to, to hold a shape um, that's not relaxed. Okay. Um, so, one of the um, really interesting things, I'm sure every Everybody knows about the bright spot that we saw when we were coming into Ceres, and people thought maybe there was flashlights and aliens. And, <laughs> um, but it's not. It's sodium carbonate. <laughs> and you can see it from space. You know, um, If you look at California, it's Lake Cyril's, the same material sitting on surface. Hydrothermal lake, saline lake. Um, similar sodium carbonate and ammonium chloride. And they're also coming out of the plumes of Enceladus. And these are the three places that we know of in our solar system where these, um, where these minerals exist. So this was a, a really um, important observation because um, the, the presence of ammonia and the, um, the chemistry that created the sodium carbonates um, is indicative of the processes that, that we were interested in understanding in terms of um, series overall evolution and its habitable potential. And then just a reminder that we did find organics at one point, but um, it's, it's a little unclear what pro by what process they were created. Okay, so where did series form? Um, because of the ammonia, it would place series formation out here in what we call the trans-Neptunian belt. That's where Ammonia is stable, um, and that would require that it was implanted, that it was scattered by this, you know, growth migration of the giant planets event, all the way into the main belt, and that's a little hard to do 
Um, and also, Ceres doesn't resemble the other objects that um, are, are, exist out here, the trans-Neptunian objects and the Kuiper Belt objects. So um, we, we don't think that's a favored hypothesis. Um, it could have been that the material that contained the ammonia was simply drifting in, um, and there was enough of it that it, it um, Ceres accreted from it in place. But as I told you before about the, um, the opening of this gap by Jupiter forming very early um, really doesn't favor that hypothesis because it's going to stop all of the material crossing that boundary. So that implies that Ceres had to be, um, had to be um, you know, on the other side of the gap to get the volatile rich material coming from you know, the, the drag coming from the outer solar system in. And um, so we, we think the likely formation region is the giant planet region. And then it would have been scattered during um, one of those uh, resonance or one of those scattering events um, into this area of the main belt. And that, as I've already explained, is, is now um, quite consistent with this emerging paradigm um, of cosmochemistry. So uh, think about this. You know, it's hypothesis emerged based on study of meteorite data and other chemical data that was available about Jupiter forming very early and opening this gap. And this mission was providing, uh, you know, sort of the first test of whether that made sense. And it does. So um, science is moving very quickly um, in planetary, um, in the planetary realm. Okay, um, I'll end series with um, a few highlights of its geologic activity. This is just to show you that um, if you enhance the colors of Ceres, you can see that there are places which are bluer and younger, have brighter material, and the background is kind of this um, orangey red color. So there are different geologic provinces, and what we find is that in the younger, brighter, and bluer areas that you saw on that map, we see evidence for um, brine-driven geology. This is the famous Ahunamans, um, a singular mountain that was seems to have been created very recently. It just um, kind of squoves up on the surface like you're squeezing a tube of toothpaste. And it's made of um, the bright streaks here are sodium carbonate. So this is one of the um, pieces of evidence that says there are still subsurface brine pockets. Um, and they are, um, and that brine is being able to make it to the surface. This is a unique area because there's no nearby impact crater. And what we're finding is that the impacts themselves create heat, which melts a lot of the um, frozen brines in the surface and then drives this sort of hydrothermal system that brings them to the surface. But in this case, there's no obvious heat source. So it may be just a slow freezing um, of the uh, subsurface crust, which is creating volume changes. And that is enough to you know, be squeezing these uh, residual fluids to the surface. Really fascinating. Um, so we'll take a little tour of Akatur Crater. That's the, the famous one that hosts the bright spots. We took a, a close look at this in our last mission phase. So here we're seeing things at 10 meters per pixel. Um, that's a, a really fine scale for this kind of exploration. And you can see a lot of um, the details of this bright deposit with its radial fractures, um, sharp boundaries, um, and, and just different character of the deposits around the central pit. Um, this is an example of, again, some carbonate coming out on the, the, the crater wall um, as a, some sort of chunk that's stuck in the, 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 the subsurface and it's, it's poking out. Um, we have clearly different types of materials. Um, some are more, um, more competent, more like rock-like or sandstone-like. And, um, and then we have the, the, the fluffy material. Um, we saw a lot of fractures. They seem to be associated with um, the emergence of this bright material from the subsurface, um, as you'll see in, in the next uh, video. And, and this was a, a, a really interesting feature that came into sharp focus with the high resolution data. It's a, what we called um, a mesa, but it's really a ledge. This is a, this is a high standing um, massif and there's kind of a ledge on the side of it, and it's just coated with this bright material. And you can see it dripping down the, 
down the um, steep wall. And so there's another example of, of evidence for the material coming out of the subsurface onto the surface um, and, and coating things, not um, that it was there from the very beginning. So a, a lot of evidence for ongoing processes. So I'm going to give you um, a chance to, to watch this movie for a minute. Um, it's a flyover of the crater, and you can see that the, um, the bright deposits seem to be associated with fractures in one part of the crater. Um, and then they're clustering around the central pit. Um, that's the area we were just looking at. And here you're seeing um, how the resolution of our data changed as we went and got closer to the surface and the kind of detail we saw in the impact melt uh, lobes and, um, and just the, the overall character of the surface when we, we got that very high resolution data. And it's taught us a tremendous amount about the process by which this material was coming up to the surface and the, and the relative youth. It's, it's a very recent process. So here's that, the tholus, the dome in the center, um, and that, uh, that other region that I mentioned. OK. So I'm going to, a couple of bullets, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about the Psyche mission. And um, thanks for sticking with me. So we, we learned the Vesta and Ceres form closely in time. Uh, with similar amounts of radioact shortly radioactive material, but their paths diverged largely as a result of their initial composition, volatile poor for Vesta, volatile rich for Ceres. Ceres incorporated abundant ammonia, so um, indicating that it formed beyond 5 AU and migrated to its current neighborhood. And the ongoing geologic activity there suggests that habitable environments possibly existed within the uh, dwarf planet, so both the subsurface ocean and, and then the ongoing um, brine activity indicate a very active and, um, and, and wet uh, interior. And then I've already uh, talked about its affinity to these um, icy moons, but um, clearly Ceres is going to help us as we get to Europa with the Europa Clipper mission to better understand what's going on there and hopefully when we get to Enceladus <laughs> someday. OK, so um, now we're back to the iron meteorites. This one's big. <laughs> um, this is one of my favorite pictures for, for a couple of reasons. One is um, it's, it's a beautiful meteorite. Um, second is I don't think they allow you to sit on them anymore. <laughs> but these, these two kids are, are preserved forever in posterity in this picture. OK, so um, we've learned a lot from iron meteorites. So maybe we should go to a, an object that looks like the iron core of one of these bodies. And that would be the Psyche mission. It's a journey to a metal world. Um, it will launch in 2022 and arrive to this exotic metal world in 2026. This is an artist's rendition. Um, by Peter Rubin. He, he's a Hollywood artist, and he's damn good. <laughs> and uh, listening, you know, he listens to scientists, and then he comes up with his, um, his uh, he lets his imagination tell him what it might look like. So um, Psyche is, uh, I've talked about planetesimals being the building blocks of planets, talked about how the dust particles came together, then we formed these, you know, large planetesimals, some of them differentiated very quickly. Um, and some of them didn't make it because they got um, crushed. <laughs> so um, when two, bo two large bodies collide at high speed, then um, it, it causes uh, like basically a total disruption. And um, this is called, in, in the parlance, a hit and run, um, where you can strip all of the materials, um, you s strip all the materials disrupt them all, and then things can reaccrete. Um, but in a hit and run, you're left, because of the um, momentum of the, the particles, with separation of the different layers so that you don't end up putting the body back together. So we think that Psyche may be the naked remnant of a planetesimal's metal core stripped by these collisions. 
And here's another illustration um, to, to try to capture the violence of that event, where um, you know, this, this may have been psyche, and this is the, um, the impactor, and everything's just one molten ball of stuff. Um, but then um, it comes back together. So if we start with um, the parent body of psyche, and, and I should have mentioned before, Psyche is the name of the mission, and Psyche is the name of the object. It's 16 Psyche. Um, so when I say Psyche, it's both. <laughs> but so here we have, we have the impactor disrupting, and then what, what we're left here with is the core. The iron core is now reaccreting, and it's been stripped of the rock. It's been stripped of like the basalt and the, and the mantle, and now it's going to cool and form this metallic body. So the question is, um, w w based on what it's made of, um, it may manifest, its surface may manifest uh, different characteristics. And so what we're after is to look at um, three main characteristics of this body and try to understand if it really is the stripped core of um, a planetesimal. So the, one of the main ways we do that is by um, looking at for its magnetic field, because a, um, a circulating conductor or a moving conductor will create a magnetic field, and within um, bodies with molten cores, um, the rotation will drive a dynamo, and that will create a magnetic field. And so if we see a magnetic field, we'll know um, that this body um, started to cool at the um, outside, and it cooled inward. And it could possibly, after it, it finished cooling, uh, have been disrupted again. And what we're left with is a what's called a remnant field, a frozen field frozen into the rocks. So we could see either, um, either of these two states. Um, if this body uh, formed, um, if it cooled from the um, inside outward, um, then it would not have been able to sustain a magnetic field, and we would expect to see nothing. So it would be inconclusive. Now, if we combine um, what we, we find with the magnetic field to what's on the surface, whether we see any um, silicates, uh, especially sulfur on the surface, or, um, and with the nickel content, then we can, um, we can uh, find a dis a specific answer to the question of um, whether it's the core of a differentiated planetesimal or um, perhaps the unexpected <laughs> result that this is not have, does not have to do with a planetesimal differentiation event, but it could just be metal that was accreted directly from the solar nebula. And that would be a completely unexpected result. But um, perhaps not out of the question. So uh, we're, we're going to be uh, making these very simple measurements, looking at um, what kind of minerals are on the surface, um, what kind of structures, are there, are there sulfur lava flows on the surface, um, what is the nickel content that we can measure with the elemental um, abundance from gamma ray neutron spectrometer, and then what is the magnetic field character. And it's just a cartoon to say that we, because the sulfur fluids are, um, will stick around, you know, uh, the, they'll stay liquid longer than the iron nickel metal. Um, and as the core freezes, they could be, you know, driven out through cracks and, and create these sulfur volcanoes on the surface. Very interesting. <laughs> um, and then finally, this, this is a meteorite that represents the core mantle boundary of a differentiated body. They're called palisites. Um, there's many in the meteorite collection. Those are um, crystals of olivine in an, an iron nickel matrix. And so we might be seeing um, beautiful crystals of olivine you know, on the surface of Psyche as well. But this is all just conjecture. We really don't know, and that's why we're going there. And then finally, um, just what, what's this thing going to look like? We don't know what, it, um, what an impact into a metal object would do, but um, in anticipation, we're trying to find out by doing some experiments with an air gun up at the Ames Research Center and, and 
and basically shooting uh, ingots into, into metal. And here's a, a, the resulting impact crater, so we might be seeing stuff like that. Um, okay, you made it. <laughs> here's a few takeaways. Um, the population of small worlds in our solar system record its history. I hope I've convinced you of that. The the slide of answer doesn't always work, but I'm going to try this. Okay, and and importantly, they they were there to record the important processes and events that shaped our planetary neighborhood, both um, the small and the larger bodies. They can be used to test various hypotheses, disk chemistry, internal evolutionary processes, dynamic scattering. And those processes have important implications for distribution of water, creation of habitable environments. So they're essentially you know, critical um, with, with all the other exploration we're doing to really develop a full picture of how our solar system formed and came to be what we have today. So in my view, small body exploration and sample return is, um, the, has the greatest promise for continued rich rewards in understanding our, 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 our neighborhood. So let's just um, end with uh, what's coming up besides Psyche is that uh, we're now at the asteroid Bennu, Bennu the um, OSIRIS-REx mission, and the Japanese Hayabusa 2 mission is at Ryugu. They're both collecting samples and returning samples to the Earth. So we're going to understand what these very small but important um, carbon-rich asteroids from our neighborhood um, can tell us about uh, early evolution. Uh, also, uh, spacecraft is going out to visit the Jupiter Trojans, um, the NASA Lucy mission, and the Trojans come from all over. They were captured by Jupiter in these clumps in the, at the Jupiter Sun Lagrange points. And so they're a nice collection of material um, to, to take a look at. And then, um, in addition, we would like to go to other early form planetesimals. Uh, to, to try to um, continue to hone our understanding of that early period, uh, go visit more comets, and in particular, active asteroids, which could be one of the sources of water to the Earth. And then um, we're, we're on the cusp of being able to visit large numbers of near-Earth objects um, with capable small satellites so that we can um, really start to fill in the statistics of what these bodies are like and, and you know, fill in our knowledge about um, the overall picture. So with that, I hope I've given you a, a good overview. There's a few um, links here if you want to learn more. And I'd be happy to take questions. And thank you so much for your attention. So folks, if you are here on lab and you have questions, you're going to step up to the microphone. Uh, we've got some questions from our online viewers. Uh, we've got somebody up to the microphone already, so let's get it started. Uh, first of all, thank you for one of the coolest Von Karma lectures of all time. <laughs> it was absolutely exceptional. Um, I had a question about the hydrated deposits on Vesta. Um, given that the ejecta plume kind of occupied a third of the body's diameter, um, that would suggest a, an absolutely insane impact. Uh, wouldn't we expect a massive excavation basin, kind of like like the South Pole Aiken Basin? And uh, and then a related question: uh, with the uh, the thermal profile of that impact, wouldn't we expect all the volatiles to have boiled off in the impact area and just be in the in ejecta plume? Great questions. Um, am I on? Yeah. Okay. So we think that. All of that um, dark material actually came out of one of the giant basins in the south, the Venonea Basin, to be exact. And uh, that's a 400-kilometer diameter basin on, on you know, a 530-kilometer diameter body. So it's a, it's a big basin. Um, and it, it looks like the material was kind of like thrown up, or the, the impactor was not um, 
was retained, but it, it, the ejecta uh, was, was thrown up to the, the area that we're seeing it now. Um, there's a big difference in impact velocity in the main belt versus, um, say, the moon. Difference in gravity and, and just the speed at which the objects are interacting with each other. So um, it, we expect asteroid collisions to be in the five kilometers per second range. Um, only a comet would be energetic enough that it could vaporize all of the volatiles. And also, I'll just mention, it's really hard to get water out of minerals. Um, so if it's already locked into the minerals, then you're going to have to heat it up to, say, 400 degrees C before you drive the water off. Thank you. Great. And LA Football Club t-shirt. How will you uh, f find Psyche when you like uh, launch it? Because it's like it'll take like six, like four years to reach there. How will you, how will you like like find it? How will we find Psyche once we send the mission Psyche out to Psyche? Yeah. How yeah. will we find it? Okay. <laughs> um, so it's more like this. It's more like when we launch. Um, we're getting into the car and turning it on. Um, so the rocket takes us out of Earth's gravity well. And then we turn on the ion engine. And the controllers here on the ground are constantly watching it because it's talking to the deep space network, the dishes that are listening all the time. So they're talking back and forth. And it knows that's kind of like GPS. You know, you can always figure out where you are. And then the, um, the navigators figure out what forces are you know, pushing, kind of like a wind pushing a sailboat. You, know, you kind of figure out what little forces are maybe putting you off the, the track, and you make little adjustments to get back on. With an ion propulsion mission like Dawn was and Psyche is, you, you're driving all the time. You're, you're thrusting all the time, and so you're, you're making all these adjustments. So it's, it's a... a process of being constantly aware and interacting with the spacecraft all the way there. But how will you like uh, um, like react in time because uh, it t takes like time yeah, to reach? Yeah, so there's a light time um, which for that distance will end up being, uh, you know, it'll grow from almost nothing right after launch to uh, on the order of 20 to 25 minutes. And that, that means, you know, this, when you talk, it hears it 25 minutes later and, and you get a response. Okay. Um, before we ask our next one in-house, uh, Zhi Ying asks, are there any plans to return to Ceres after the Dawn mission? Well, NASA is quite interested in returning to Ceres. It has, um, or many of the planetary science scientists have expressed the interest in going back and landing on the surface and either um, using some you know, equipment to try to um, sample the material um, below the surface or, um, or just rove around and, and, and do other things. But there are a lot of studies going on, um, so nothing is, is certain right now, but um, there, there are certainly going to be a set of studies that will be conducted and then proposals will be written. The process will you know, chink, chunk along and maybe sometime in the next decade we'll have another mission to series. Okay. Yes, sir. Um, do you know if there is any volcanic activity on any of the planets you mentioned here? Is there any volcanic activity on, on any of these objects we're looking at out there? Um, so we expected that we would see some volcanic features on Vesta. Because as I told you, it, it was a volcanically, it, it, it was born from a volcanic process. Um, the basalts erupted on the surface. They covered the surface like, like the, you know, the ocean floor um, is created. So we thought we'd see you know, individual volcanoes or something that we could identify. We found nothing. That doesn't mean those features weren't there. It just means they're not there anymore. Um, they've been either covered over with, with um, ejecta from impacts or they've been, um, the rock has just been pulverized. Um, but we know that volcanism would have happened very early on, like the first 100 million years of uh, Vesta's history. And so there's a lot of time for any of those features to get ground down. Um, on Ceres, what I showed you there, 
that um, Ohuna Mons is has been referred to as a cryovolcano. So a cryovolcano is made of a magma, which is water, frozen. Um, we, you know, it's kind of a term that's not well defined, but essentially it means that fluids are coming out of the interior and they're creating features that, that are constructional in nature. Um, psyche, uh, I mentioned maybe sulfur volcanoes, but that's just total conjecture. Um, we, d we don't know. So um, hopefully we'll find something really interesting there. Stay tuned. Great. Uh, and actually, we've got time for one last question. It's coming from, from our online. If, you have, if you're in-house and you've got questions, feel free to come up afterwards. You can ask those questions. But our last one comes from Mozart uh, on YouTube and asks, how alike are Ceres and Pluto? Ceres and Pluto. Um, so Ceres, they are not that similar. Um, Pluto is quite a bit larger than Ceres. And um, it's so much colder that its, its surface is, um, you know, the surface that we saw um, with New Horizons shows these vast um, sea of, of nitrogen ice uh, in Sputnik Planitia. And so the materials on the surface are different. Um, I think some of the processes are different. Um, it appears that, that Pluto also um, accreted from more, probably more volatile rich material than Ceres did. What is similar about the two is the fact that, um, as I mentioned before, there's documented volcanic, sorry, documented geologic activity on Pluto, which was rather unexpected, and on Ceres as well. So the similarity may be not so much between those two objects as um, that being common amongst um, a lot of these larger bodies throughout the solar system. That you know, the geology just does not sleep, and and things things just keep happening. And 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 also for Pluto and for Ceres, impacts are a really important driver of this activity. And we know that um, impacts occur on all bodies across the solar system. So um, we have a lot of potential for these types of um, interesting features and situations on other bodies as well. Very cool. Well, that is all the time we have for tonight. Let's give a bit, Dr. Carol Raymond a big round of applause. Please join us next month, uh, September 19th and 20th, for It Broke, a story of how we fixed it. Thank you, and have a wonderful evening, everybody. <laughs> Thank you. Feel good? I do. Yeah. Okay, good. I always think I'm going to do go faster than I do.